seminar lecture for the Lagos Diocesan Medical Commission for 2020. And we will start with some choruses and a prayer before we go on to the lecture. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And we start with choruses. Oh, glory, glory, glory to the Lord. Oh, glory. Oh, glory, glory, glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna be the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be the name. Oh, the Lord, take glory, Father, take glory, Son, take glory, Holy Ghost, now and forever. Take glory, Father, take glory, Son, take glory, Holy Ghost, now and forever. Jesus, we are here, Jesus. Jesus, we are here, we are here for you. Holy Spirit, we are here. Holy Spirit, we are. Holy Spirit, we are here, we are here for you. Father, we are here. Jesus' name we worship. I will call on Dr. to give us the opening prayer. Shall we pray? You are God from beginning to the end. There's no place for argument. You are God all by yourself. You are God, you are God, from beginning to the end. There's no place for argument, you are God all by yourself. And so, Father, because you are God all by yourself, this morning as we gather, we want to give you thanks. Praise you for your glory, Father, we adore you. Because if not for your mercies, the midst of all that's been going on would all have been consumed. Father, we thank you. Father, we give you praise. Father, we magnify your holy name. And so, Father, we've gathered here this morning to listen to a lecture. Thank you that you've made it possible for us in your house. For months we couldn't do this. Father, we thank you that we can now worship in church. So, Father, we want to commit this gathering unto your hands. We lift up the lecturer before the throne of grace. What she has to tell us should be communicated in power and be received in humility. Guide her to tell us that which we ought to know. Please glorify your name. Father, we thank you for all the people who have made this gathering possible. Lift them up before the throne of grace. We thank you for the members of the Lagos Diocesan Medical Mission. We thank you for their leadership. We thank you for our diocesan and for his strong vision and mission for this diocese. 
We thank you for all the men of God, particularly the vicar and all who work in this particular church. And Father, thank you for the powerful army of young people you are raising to make our ICT powerful and possible. Because we know, even as we gather, we are being watched from all corners of the world. Father, we thank you for that possibility. And so we want to start this meeting. We commit everything we'll be doing this morning into your hands. And we start it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter Madu, for that uh, opening prayer. We give glory to God for your life. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just by way of uh, some level of introduction, the Lagos Diocesan Medical Commission annually does a lecture seminar on a topic that will be useful to the general public and particularly to the congregation of Lagos Diocese. Let me tell you and glorify God for today. In the last six months, the Diocese Medical Commission had not met at all because of the pandemic. It has pleased God to allow this lecture to hold, which we have been planning since January. And we want to give glory to God that the ban has been lifted, and we are here just two weeks after that to do this lecture. So to God be the glory. We also want to thank the diocesan, his lordship, Right Reverend Dr. Humphrey Olumakaye, for giving us the opportunity to uh, carry out this lecture, you know, through Zoom and through the um, uh, Lagos Lagoon and TV. We want to thank him tremendously for that. In the last six months, five to six months, the mode of worship had continued to be through streaming and Zoom lectures, prayer meetings, and the various things of the church. And I have observed that since then, things have improved. What I mean that the participation from people from the corners of their homes has increased. And we want to give glory to God for that. And therefore, for this uh, lecture, we believe, and we have publicized this fairly extensively, to ensure that not only the members of the Diocese Medical Commission, but all parishes in this our diocese and beyond, all parishes and beyond, will have the opportunity to listen to the 2020 uh, annual lecture seminar for the Diocese Medical Commission. I can tell you from, uh, from authority that people are going to watch this program from beyond our diocese. And therefore, we want to thank specifically the media, the Diocese Media uh, Group, and uh, led by uh, Venerable um, Orelua Agbelusi and his team, to thank them tremendously for making available the Lagoon TV radio, as well as the uh, Facebook, Instagram, and all of that, which they normally use to circulate, to get people to you know, attend th things like this. I want to thank them tremendously. And also to thank our viewers who are within their, the corners of their houses and rooms to please to hook up to the Lagoon TV radio, Instagram, and all the rest, as well as streaming from our Savior's Church, Tafa Balewa Square, as if you are on a Sunday. Just go on to the uh, YouTube and put our Savior's Church. You can see it very, very clearly. And as well to thank those who are also joining us from beyond the shores, people in the UK, some people in the US, they are sleeping now, but the UK can join us. I'm aware one or two people are joining from the UK. So we want to thank all of these people, and then 
uh, without too much you know, ado, we'll go straight forward uh, for the lecture. At the end of the lecture, we would see if we can get Zoom a number through which people can ask questions. People can ask questions. We hope to be able to achieve that. But for meanwhile, please enjoy yourself and then let us be able to learn, you know, from the lecture. The lecture for today is very topical, very, very important. And the, the, the topic is the blinding disease of the eye. The blinding disease of the eye. And this is very, very, you know, important, particularly for the more elderly one. From an age of 40, 45 and above, it becomes very, very important to take care of your eye. The eye is so important, it's so germane for people who have lost their sight, you know, through one form of the other. This is an opportunity to learn and also communicate this to your friends about prevention, and management, emphasis on prevention and management. We don't want people, our members, you know, congregation in the Lagos diocese to go blind or to have their vision to be reduced from one form or the other. That is the importance of this lecture. In particular, we want to encourage, I hope, the elderly fellowship, the men's fellowship, the women's organization, um, and, the, the, and the ladies and all of them, every member of the Lagos Diocese should hook up to this and learn and make sure that they have good vision and prevent that they can prevent you know, uh, their sight getting worse or going blind and ensure and if, and if you have any challenges the lecturer will touch on some methods that you can use where you can go and that kind of stuff to make sure that you don't go blind. That is the uh, importance of this, of this lecture. Therefore, I'm going to, the, our lecturer for today, I will introduce her. She is no less a person than Dr. Mrs. Henrietta Nwachuku. She is one of us. She's a consultant ophthalmologist and um, trained in Port Harcourt, and she is now in Lagos. She's now a consultant ophthalmologist in Lagos, one of the outfits here in Lagos. And she's going to help us to elucidate and you know, come up with what to do justice to the topic of today. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want you to help me welcome Welcome, very warmly, Dr. Mrs. Henrietta Nwachuku. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for the introduction again. I'm grateful to God who has given me an opportunity to be standing here today, who has given me also the opportunity to be able to deliver this lecture. I want to also thank the diocese for this opportunity and also the medical commission of the diocese. The topic for today's lecture, I know, is blinding diseases of the eye, prevention and management. Before I go ahead to talk about the blinding diseases, let me define blindness. By layman definition, blindness is a state of being totally blind in one eye, that's sightless in one eye or both. But for us, we don't take people who are completely blind as blindness. There are some people that have some form of vision. They can navigate, but they navigate because they can see things that are just close to them. So, we define blindness as a relative term to signify severe visual impairment or low vision, meaning that even with glasses, medicine, or surgeries, these persons cannot regain good vision. This visual impairment can be temporary or permanent. 
Now let's talk about statistics because this will help us to know the magnitude of blindness in our society and the world at large. Globally, about 2.2 people are blind and at least are visually impaired, sorry, and at least one million of them have, unprevent, they have preventable blindness. Now, uncorrected refractive error. There are some people who have some form of refractive errors and Some people have some form of refractive error and because they could see, they don't take it as being serious. They neglect it. And before you know what's happening, it becomes so severe that corrections will not even give them good vision. And about 123.7 million of people have such blindness. Cataracts is regarded as the commonest cause of preventable blindness. And it accounts for about 65.2 million. Glaucoma is the commonest type of untreatable blindness. Please take note of that. Cataract is a treatable blindness. Glaucoma is untreatable blindness. So what do I mean? For patients that have cataracts, when we do surgery for them, they regain vision. But once a patient with glaucoma becomes blind, the blindness is permanent. So I want us to take note of the fact that cataract is the commonest cause of preventable, of correctable blindness, while glaucoma is the commonest cause of untreatable blindness. Cornea opacity accounts for 4.2 million. Diabetic retinopathy, 3 million. Unaddressed presbyopia, 826 million. Uncorrected presbyopia, I won't be talking about it in detail, so let me just say something about them. It's a form of visual impairment that occurs in adults as they get to age 40 and above. A patient also just suddenly discovered that he has difficulty with reading near vision. For such people with glasses, they can do well. That is why I'm not discussing it in my lecture. Now, 80% of people who are blind are over age 50. And the prevalence of distant visual impairments in low and middle income region, which is where we belong to, accounts for four times higher than in developed areas. So we should take note of that. A lot of our people are blind. And they are going blind because of negligence and poverty. Now, in children, about 1.5 per thousand children in low-income countries are also blind, as compared to 0 0.8 per thousand children in well-developed countries that are blind. Globally, we have about 1.4 million children who are blind, and three-quarter of these children are in Africa and Asia. Risk factors for blindness. The risk factors for blindness are poverty, poor access to medical care, advancing age, poor nutrition, poor hygiene, smoking or excessive alcohol intake, family history of blindness, medical conditions such as diabetic, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases and cardio um, cerebrovascular diseases, trauma, Prematurity, congenital condition, and failure to use glasses. Commonest causes of blindness, these are the ones I'm going to be discussing in details. They are cataracts, glaucoma, retinoblastoma, 
retinopathy of prematurity, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, corneal opacity, optic atrophy, retinitis pigmentosa, trachoma, oncocercosis, and toxoplasmosis. Cataract, like I said, is the commonest cause of reversible blindness and is responsible for 51% of the world blindness. And globally, the cataracts account for 53.8 million moderate to severe cases of disability. And 52% of these people are in low-income country. I'm emphasizing this because this is who we are and where we are. So we need to take this home so that we can help our people not to get blind. In children, blindness could result from congenital defects, rubella and the others. It could also result from trauma. Cataract presents gradually and patient just starts by saying that my vision is not clear it looks like it wants to rain everywhere is cloudy it's as if there's smoke and it progresses gradually until this person can no longer see now aging is the commonest cause of cataracts others could be trauma it could be like i said in children could be congenital then some other eye diseases also can also cause Blind and um, cataract blindness. Now, how can we prevent this? We can't stop aging. We can't stop the body system. So that is not in our hands. We can't stop the congenital cases also. So those ones are not in our hands. Even though the, we are waiting, the whites are working on some genetic um, therapy and diagnosis that can help us identify these people and also treat them from the conception period. Treatments for cataracts are mainly use of spectacle in the early stage and at its progresses and worsens, we do surgery for such patients. Now, I just write here couching and a fake hair. Couching is a very serious um, procedure that actually it was the early type of cataract surgery that was done in those days. And with improvement in technology, it has been phased out. But we discovered that a lot of people still engage in couching. Now, why are we worried about this couching? It is a very cruel form of surgery. It causes blindness because it will only help this patient to recover vision briefly only for a short time and it's associated with a lot of comp complications that this patient may end up going irreversibly blind now a fake here is a patient that has had cataract surgery the lens has been extracted but due to one reason or the other was not able to have an intraocular lens, that's an artificial lens implanted into the eye. So this patient has had cataract surgery, but yet could not see. Sometimes we do secondary implantation of intraocular lens. In, if, it's, if, the eye, if the architecture of the eye is good enough, then patient can regain vision. But otherwise, an aphakic patient is regarded as being blind. Glaucoma. This is an eye disease that affects the optic nerve. It's mostly associated with raised intraocular pressure. There's um, high pressures in the eye. Just as we have high blood pressures, we have high pressure also in the eye. And this happens when there is obstruction in the flow of the fluid inside the eye. It's a major cause of irreversible blindness. About 6 to 67 million people have glaucoma globally and it accounts for 5 million blindness globally. It is hereditary and it's worse in second generation. What do I mean? 
if a father has um, glaucoma, his glaucoma may develop at the age of 50. If some of us have seen some children that have some fungating mass coming out from their eye, it's usually caused by retinoblastoma. This can be prevented by genetic testing and also counseling. Why do we talk about counseling here? The possibility that if a child has retinoblastoma, that the sibling can have it, is always there. So if one child should have retinoblastoma, it is very important to screen and examine other children. And also, the parents, too, are supposed to talk to their own sibling to look out for their children. Because you never can tell which line of the gene the retinoblastoma is coming from. Treatment is usually chemotherapy or surgery. I wouldn't want to talk about what type of surgery. Retinopathy of prematurity is a very important one here in our community because children who are born premature are usually kept in the incubator for some time until they are strong enough to come out. Now, while in the incubator, they are exposed to some form of oxygen. This oxygen are not too good for the retina. Why? Because the retina, as at when this child was delivered, was not fully developed. So this oxygen now hurts development of the retina and now triggers other um, conditions which we refer as retinopathy of prematurity. Now, it's a cause of blindness in children in middle and low income country. Why? Because the care for these children who are born prematurity, premature here in our community is low. There's poor care for them. We don't have enough of the facility. Although, presently, a lot of hospitals are beefing up because the oxygen that are being delivered has to be regulated. It's not just 100% oxygen you just deliver to the child. But right now, I think a lot of hospitals are beginning to step up. So I'm sure with time, a lot of these cases will be reduced. We are also looking out for these children. Studies have shown that it's not only children who are born prematurely that developed retinopathy of prematurity. So there are screening ongoing right now for all newborn children looking out for retinopathy of prematurity. Why is that? Because early detection will also help to save their vision. Okay. Treatments could be, um, there are some anti, um, va antivascular endothelial growth factor injections that we give. Then for those who have developed the blindness, I think there's little or nothing that, that can be done for them. Age-related macular degeneration, this is the fourth commonest cause of irreversible blindness and usually occur in adults 60 years and above. Affects about 6.2 million people globally. Risk factors include aging, smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, high cholesterol level, and positive family history. Patients present with diminution of vision, image distortion, and color desaturation. That color appears faded. Image di di distortion means that when they look at somebody, the person either, when they look at the face, maybe the nose area is missing, or the person appears bent. You know? Now, how do we prevent this? Regular eye check with advancing age. Just as you go about checking for your blood pressure and diabetes, it is also very important that you check your eyes annually for a lot of 
diseases that comes up with aging. Treatment, there's actually no cure, but we advise antioxidants early enough, even before it starts prevent, presenting and even while it's at its early stage of presentation. Some people who develop some other complication as a result of this are offered laser and if no improvement with all forms of treatment, we offer low vision aids to help them. Diabetic retinopathy, this occur in people who are diabetic for over 10 to 20 years, especially those who are type 2 diabetics. Affects 80% of these patients. It accounts for 5 million blindness worldwide. Presentation, blurring of vision, impaired color vision, fluctuation, fluctuating vision. When I say fluctuating vision, it means that when your blood sugar is high, the refractive state of your eye differs. And when your blood sugar comes back to normal, it changes also the refractive state of the eye. So how can this patient know that this is happening? Somebody that is diabetic, he uses glasses, then all of a sudden he now says that his glasses is not working for him. Meanwhile, he got that glasses two, three months ago. When he comes to the hospital, the first thing we ask, what is your blood sugar? Or we send this patient for an investigation that will tell us what the blood sugar has been in the past three months. If it has not been well controlled, it could be accounted for, the fluctuation in the vision. Now, it is also said that people with diabetes, apart from diabetic retinopathy, which is more or less a disease of the retina, the vasculature of the retina and some other complications that occurs there, it can also cause cataract. Why? Because once the blood sugar are high, it makes the lens of the eye to imbibe a lot of water and they develop cataract. So it is very important that patients with diabetes should control their diabetes. Diabetes is not a death sentence. Some people, once they tell them that they are diabetic, it's as if the world is over. But the good news is that people live 40 years with diabetes and they are fine. And when they die, they don't even die from diabetes. They die from other illness or something else entirely. So diabetes is a disease that can be controlled. Diabetic retinopathy can also only come up if there's poor control of diabetes. So for every diabetic patient, it is advised that you do routine checkup. Routine checkup. You don't need to wait until you start having blurring of vision before you start seeking help for the visual control. Okay, prevention and treatment, streets, blood sugar control, and annual exam. Hypertensive retinopathy. This is also a complication that can arose in patients with raised blood pressure, especially those whose blood pressure are poorly controlled. It is an indicator that once you have hypertensive retinopathy, which is also the case with diabetic retinopathy, it means that all the systems in the body have been affected. Diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, the two of them, once they come up, it means that the other systems are also affected. So it is very important that we take care of our blood pressures, especially for those of us who are hypertensive. I've seen a lot of hypertensive patients that come and say, eh, my blood pressure has been normal for some time. I've stopped taking my drug. And by the time we are checking, it is 200 and something over 100 and something. It, it, it doesn't work that way. If you are hypertensive, you need to go for regular checkup. Let the doctor tell you 
reduce your drug. I don't think a doctor will ever stop a drug for hypertensives. It can only reduce it. So please, we shouldn't ignore that. Risk factors include high salt diets, obesity, tobacco or alcohol intake, family history, and stress. Women are more affected in the elderly age group. So let's take note of that, women, because no woman must die. Treatments include good BP control, regular eye check, and when we find hypertensive retinopathy, even in diabetic retinopathy, the, the secret is that once these two things are controlled, if the condition of the eye is not really bad, all the signs begin to reverse. Once the signs of diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy comes up and a patient is being told, please check your blood sugar, check your blood pressure, and this patient went back home, controlled them, these symptoms reverses. But if you present with these cases and we start to institute treatment, and yet the blood sugar is not controlled, the blood pressure is not controlled, it's like pouring water in a basket. We won't go anywhere. Ocular op uh, cornea opacity. This is a visual impairment that occurs from a vast cause. It can be from use of traditional eye medication. This is commonly used in children in the rural area. When a child comes down with measles, they will say, put pancanel oil in the eye or put engine oil in the eye. Or they go and get leaf water and put in the eye. A lot of people, when they have um, Apollo, the redness in the eye, viral conjunctivitis, they go ahead and use all sorts of things. You can't even imagine it urine fuel I've seen somebody that applied fuel in both eyes and he was blind immediately fuel, petrol purple water leave water all sorts of things there are a lot of people out there that mix all sorts of things and give people to apply to the eye and do you know the bad part of it it's not even education because even some educated people do them. They apply them. Cornea opacity can also ensue from excessive use of steroid eye drop. You know, here we always patronize uh, pharmaceutical shops and say, my eyes is red, my eyes has always been scratching me. And those people keep giving steroid, 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 steroid. And because you use the steroid and you have some form of relief, ah, why do I go to the hospital and spend money? You now kept on using steroid, steroid, steroid. And before you know what's happening, your cornea is gone. It turns white, or sometimes it melts out. Now, other causes of cornea opacity are trachoma. I'm sure we think that trachoma does not exist anymore, but it's very much in existence, especially in the north. Okay? Trachoma is a disease that causes corneal opacity. Onchocerciasis is also in existence, but not very much in the eastern part of the country. Leprosy is there. There are, in fact, the leprosy is still there a lot. It's just that they have their own community and they stay on their own. And because of the insensitivity of their nerves, when they have eye trauma, their lashes are interned, rubbing on the eyes, and before you know, the cornea is traumatized, it heals, and when it heals, it heals with opacity. They, they don't even realize until they are blind. Ocular trauma from ROTA, children playing with broom, playing with sharp objects, throwing things at each other, or children fighting 
and they give themselves punch on the eye or they throw something at themselves or use whatever is, um, um, weapon to fight. Cornea ulceration. Cornea ulceration is very common with diabetic because they also have low cornea sensitivity. So if they have a trauma, they won't feel it. And before you know, it develops an ulcer. And when an ulcer is poorly treated, it heals with a scar. And that scar is what we refer as the corneal opacity. Herpes infection is a viral infection common in elderly or the immunosuppressed people. It also comes down with corneal opacity if the cornea is affected. And the opacity results from, it starts with an ulcer, then heals with a scar. Okay, I've talked about Moses, measles. Um, vitamin A deficiency, although we are overcoming this now with a lot of um, uh, supplements, vitamin A, and also fortified foods with vitamin A. So very few people come down with this vitamin A deficiency that can result to corneal opacity. Traditional eye medication, I've talked about it. How do we prevent corneal opacity? By use of vitamin A supplements or fortified food with vitamin A. All our sugar are fortified with vitamin A. Vaccination against measles. Control of infection. Once you just notice anything in the eye, please seek a doctor's advice. Avoid trauma, then good ocular hygiene. Good ocular hygiene in the sense that patients with trachoma, they need a lot of both ocular and general hygiene because the trachoma the implicating um, organism is introduced into the eye with our hands. So they require a lot of hygiene to have it controlled. Retinitis pigmentosa is more or less an hereditary disease that affects the cone and the rods in the retina and it's an irreversible blindness. Most times it's hereditary, but sometimes can be um, sporadic, it can just occur in anybody. It occurs in one in 3,000 to one in 5,000 people. Uncorrected refractive error, this can result to amblyopia. And amblyopia is hardly treated, although we still do a lot of things to see how we can recover some of the vision that this child or individual have lost, but it's usually minimal. Affects about 5 million people. Prevention, optical correction, or use of low vision. Now, prevention generally, that's what I want to be talking about now. Blindness can be preventable through a combination of education, just like I'm doing, and also good medical care. Most traumatic cases can be prevented through high protection. Nutritional causes are preventable through proper diet. Blindness from glaucoma are preventable through early detection and appropriate treatment. Infectious causes can greatly be reduced through international public health measure. And what do we mean by this? We identify those public health diseases like the trachoma, onchocerciasis. We talk to the people, we go into community, talk to the people, give them health education, teach them eye and fa um, facial and general hygiene, the environment also. So that's what we do. Blindness from diabetic retinopathy can be controlled with good blood sugar control. Exercise, avoid obesity and smoking. Regular eye examination may often uncover 
some potentially blinding illnesses, such as glaucoma, that can be treated before they become visual loss. Gene therapy for certain inheritable diseases, such as retinitis, pigmentosa, are ongoing. Improvement in diagnosis and prevention of diabetic retinopathy is also ongoing. Now, when a patient goes blind, it does not necessarily mean that that is the end of this patient's life. This patient needs to be rehabilitated. Be it a child, be it an adult, be it an elderly patient, they can be rehabilitated. Now, how do we rehabilitate them? There are a lot of um, school for the blind. And what they do there is they teach them how to use the braille. For those who can manage some low vision aids they have been given. For those who are totally blind, they are given some, there, there are some laptops that come with some um, visual audible um, devices in the sense that when you type in something, it converts it to audio. So when you want to communicate with this patient, you can always type and it's read it out for the patient. Now, even the blinds are also taught how to type. They have their own special types of laptops with some, a lot of software. So they, 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 they do a lot of typing. So they, they can, they, they actually fit into businesses. They are taught how to do some vocation, how to make bags, beads, hand wash, um, sanitizers, detail, they sell them. The thing is that they rehabilitate them to an environment where they can fit in. And they are also taught how to navigate. So they can actually be made to fit into the society once again, even if they are blind. Okay, I think this is the end of the lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, 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 very much, Dr. Wachuku. I think um, she's giving us a summary about the blinding diseases of the eyes. And um, the way we are going to take it, first of all, I'm sure there are many people that, you know, would like to ask questions. I'm not sure whether, Victor, Victor, are you there? Can you now put on the screen the Zoom thing that through which they can ask questions? Are you able to do that? No, okay. Any questions from YouTube or comments? Now, while he's trying to navigate through that, now in the last uh, 45 minutes or so, she's given us a lot of information and I just want to just remind us a little bit about some of them, but the ones that really, you know, catch my own attention and emphasis, she mentioned blinding diseases. Some are correctable, some are not correctable. In particular, glaucoma. Glaucoma is a culprit that we must pay special attention to and make sure we prevent because when it comes, it is irreversible, she said. Irreversible. And um, I have seen people in middle age, 45, you know, 50, even some 60, and it's devastating. And glaucoma is potentially treatable early. And therefore, you need to seek help, seek the knowledge, and ensure you prevent it. 
emphasis is please check, she said, check your vision and check your glaucoma stuff every time, twice a year, particularly in age. If you are over 60, you must check your pressure of the eye at least once you know, or twice every year. And after 70, in fact, you have to do it very regularly because people become blind from glaucoma when it sets in. That is it. During the week, there was one gentleman who went to University of Ibadan and read chemical engineering. I'm sure some people have read it in the papers. And she, he was trying to become a graduate in uh, industrial chemistry and became blind. It was written in the papers. And she, he found out that it was from glaucoma. And I'm sure his age there must, wouldn't have more than about 30 or 35 or whatever they're about. And he now plays keyboard. He does uh, matching, all these DJ stuff and things like that. And indeed, his children are now in the university. What I'm trying to say is that that is a living example just this week. What glaucoma can do to people and blind them. He had to study Braille. He had to study a lot of things so that even in the keyboard, you can now match and he becomes DJ. He goes to various, uh, you know, events, and he can make a, some money for himself. He couldn't. He uses God to walk around, you know, the place and things like that. Glaucoma is a terrible, highly preventable. And if you look at it, of course, he's taking us through the issue of cataract, and that this again, this is reversible. If you do the cataract extraction on time, then we are, you know, good, good to go. And make sure you check your eyes. Emphasis, check your eyes annually or biannually as you grow older. And I think that is the emphasis that I'm hearing, that we need to take away, you know, from this. Um, the issue of age, you can have any blinding diseases throughout, you know, age group, like he said, including some congenital one. And we need to really remember this and ensure that, and be very careful about our children. When they are bumping into things, if they are bumping into objects, take some more care. Or if they are beginning to have squint, you know, they are rolling their eyes to one side and things like that. These are red herring to ensure that we visit the eye clinic and ensure that you can prevent some of the things that can come later. The second thing which I think we need to take away before we take questions is the issue of hypertensive retinopathy, blinding disease through the blood pressure, you know, hypertension and diabetes. These two conditions are so common, so common within our environment that a lot of people have loss of vision and eventually blindness from these two diseases, hypertension and diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So this is very, very, very important that when we say, you know, medical commission, we say, please come for, eye, you know, come for screening, annual basis, very few people come, very few people. And we do it free of charge. You know, we tell you this annual screening for people in various parishes and things like that. Come for screening, blood pressure, you know, I mean, the diabetes, check your eyes, and things like this are very, very important. Because, you see, if you trivialize it, by the time the disease sets in, you become an invalid. You become a problem. So it is highly preventable. Therefore, please, when the commission comes out during October period and say, or any parish that comes up with, say, screening, you know, please take it serious and check yourself free. And if you want to go to any other provider and pay money, so be it. But the emphasis is on diabetes and hypertension. They are very, very serious illnesses that can lead to blindness. And I think these are some of the things that we take away that we need to know and understand and ensure that uh, there are many other small, smaller diseases, retinoblastoma and things like that. But again, but the big, big things first that we need to really take care of. So ladies and gentlemen, I, um, these are the issues that we need to really remember one thing, one of the questions I'm going to ask her, couching, because you mentioned couching. Um, you need to tell us, because I know what couching is, but you must describe it to people. You know, it's a very, it's a, it's a crude way of doing things. 
but then it causes blindness. It leads to blindness. Ignorance, I have seen people using native medicine and applying native medicine straight into the eye. They put various leaves and things like that into the eyes, direct to the eyes. And that is very dangerous. And I think these are some of the things that we see in the uh, general outpatient clinic and also in eye clinics, you know, that we need to really take care of and make sure that you don't put engine oil <laughs> into your eyes or put any of these innocuous, very harmful liquids into your eye. If you do so, you are in trouble. Then also, but I'm a, a lecturer, the issue of touching your eyes and rubbing it, some people are just some mannerism. You just rub your eyes all the time and things like that. These are some of the things that we see that can impair your vision. And I think we need to be very careful about a number of all of these things. Uh, there are other questions, I'm sure we can list them. Go around, you know, and then you can list them, and then we can come back so that you can uh, give answers to these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very educative lecture. My, my well, it's a question and probably a contribution. Education. Most people will go to the roadside uh, goggle sellers whenever they feel that they can't see very well, and they will go back there when their sight is, you know, diminishing to change their, I don't know whether they give them lenses or anything, but I believe that we, there should be a way we can discourage people because I think that's one of the reasons why they come late for treatment in the hospital. By the time they get to the hospital, their condition is very bad because they have been depending on this uh, roadside uh, of, well, goggle sellers who will give them glasses for whatever condition they have. So how do we get this education out to them? To say, don't go, if you know you are not seeing very well, go to the hospital and get proper checkup. Thank you. Yes, there are more questions. Good morning and thank you so much, Dr. Wachiku, for that very insightful um, mind of how we should be taking care of our eyes. Um, I, I was very interested to hear about um, newborn screening for retinopathy of um, prematurity. My question is really, um, is it available to all Nigerian newborns now? Every hospital, at every level, they get to get screened. Um, the other, the other, second question is pre-diabetes which, as you know, uh, precedes the frank symptoms of diabetes. I'm just wondering if uh, the eye signs, the eye early cataracts and retinopathy can actually uh, show up that early before um, actual diabetes. Uh, and then, you know, we're in this so-called new normal um, with COVID, we've been at home, by the grace of God, there are blessings because the world over is watching you and hearing, uh, taking advantage of this. A lot more people are on, on, on um, laptop screens. A lot more people are on phones, screens, Zoom. I'm just wondering whether in this period you've noticed um, worse thing, you know, more complaints with eyes because certainly I know people who are having more problems with either their backs and eyes. Now, a personal one, uh, someone I know, you know, recently started to use the laptop a lot more and kept wiping, you know, having to wipe the eyes. They kept feel, feeling a little cloudy, then they'll go off, on and off. But related to the onset of more frequent use of screens, what is your advice for hygiene, for care of the eyes when we are using phones, laptops, screens, a lot more. Uh, it affects, it's right across all ages. It's a big problem for young people as well. And also the elderly. 
I thought that was very important to, to ask. Glaucoma, I know a patient, I always used to think glaucoma was related to high intraocular pressure. Um, I, I, I've come across one or two patients who have normal pressure. So for many years, it wasn't discovered. I'm just wondering how common it is, and whether it really is easily missed, and what advice would you have to prevent that? Because we're told you should also check siblings when there's any sign of a glaucoma. But there was one patient that this came up late because actually um, pressures were always normal, uh, but it turned out the, the glaucoma. Um, and this one is a bit far-fetched, but stem cell therapy has become something like the new magic for a lot of uh, degenerative diseases, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, whatever, in any organ, tissues. I know it's very far f in terms of cost from many people, and many, it's also um, still research. But I'm just wondering what the rule might be um, if, you're, if there's a rule in some of these degenerative eye conditions, maybe for now are reversible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think, um, yes, please come forward. Good afternoon, doctor. We make sure of uh, routine of uh, routine of checking up of eyes. Because I don't understand what you mean that. Because in my own discipline, when you say routine, we are talking of transport distribution under that junction scheduling of transport. So I don't actually understand in medical terms. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there is somebody who has typed in the you know through the internet asking. One lady, Mrs. Adejoke, you know, uh, asking that uh, I guess to talk about glaucoma again. Well, the thing that Mrs. must have probably joined uh, the thing late, but we talked about glaucoma fairly early. And um, but having said that, I, I think just like I said in my own little comments earlier on, that uh, glaucoma is a serious, serious, serious disease. And I think we need to be really very, very, very careful about it. Maybe you should take this first lot of questions and answer them, and then we can go on to you know, a few more questions. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. OK, um, actually, the, some of the questions are like taking me to the scientific sides. I don't know if we can cope with that. But let's start with couching. Couching, like I said, is a cruel form of cataract surgery that was performed in the early ages. They are no longer done, like I said, because there are a lot of complications that goes with it, minimal visual impairment. Now, what does this couching entail? A patient has cataract, opacity of the lens, what they do, that's what they do now, it's commonly done in the north. They have an instrument. They just go close to the eye and poke it. It's a very simple one for them. And when they poke, the lens drops from its normal position. It detaches from its normal position and falls into the liquid um, contents of the posterior part of the eye called the vitreous. Okay? And when that happens, at that initial time, the patient will be happy. He can see at least. He can at least see. The vision may not be sharp, but he can see. But the lens in the vitreous now begin to release some proteins. It now begins to act like a foreign body in that place. And before you know what's happening, a lot of inflammatory process starts to take place. The vitreous is now angry. What are you doing here? And before you know, 
you know, it's like spilling water all over the place and everywhere is angry. And before you know, the eyes are gone. Now, when this is done, there's no form of follow-up. There's no treatment that is being given to the patient at that initial stage. So by the time these patients are presenting to us, it is too late. Because in our practice, we also have some times when we do surgery, the lens can drop into the vitreous. We have modalities of bringing them out. We have ways of implanting lens and patients can see. So that's the much I will say about couching. Because this, this is a very crude way of treating. You punch the eye, the lens falls backwards. It reminds me of treatment of mental illnesses many centuries ago. They used to beat the, you know, the mad people. They take them and beat them up, beat them, beat them thoroughly until they are really weak, you know? That's a crude way of treating mental illness. Do you understand? But later on in medicine, we now use ECT, electroconservative therapy, and which shakes them like that until, you know. But the truth is that they were using a crude method to beat the, the mentally ill until it's really weak. And that's what medicine also was trying to do. And we now use medications now, like Aptil and many other things, to weaken them. To ensure that they get so there are crude methods like this pouching thing which exists in other forms of medicine you need to be very careful about thank you thank you sir then the second question talks about frequent rubbing of the eye actually frequent rubbing of the eye can cause a lot of things it, this is also something that is easily ignored by people. My eyes are itching and they just itch and they move on. It's not really nice. Sometimes when you itch, you may rub the eye excessively over the cornea and you develop an ulcer. And when you develop an ulcer, you just notice that your eyes are red, they are pouring water. And the first place that our people will commonly go to first is the chemist. And when you go to the chemist and say your eyes are red, though, they will give you steroid. And when they give you steroid, you apply steroid, apply steroid, the ulcer will heal with a scar. Now, another thing that this can cause, especially in children, because sometimes it can be from allergic reactions. We have what we call the VKC excessive rubbing now changes the architecture of the eye which will predispose them to very high refractive error this is called the keratoconus okay this is difficult also to correct even with glasses so it can cause diminution of vision excessive rubbing of the eye can also detach some muscles of the lid Excessive rubbing of the eye can introduce infection to the eye. So it is really not advisable to rub the eye excessively. And that is why itching is a cause for visits to the hospital. I hope that has answered that question. Okay. Education, the role of education in eye care. And that is what I'm doing. When I was asked to deliver this question, um, lecture, I was very happy. Because I felt that it is an opportunity for me to tell the world something. And I know that when I do this, a lot of people will pick up something, change their ways, and adopt the right way. But the challenge we are having again is that our people will always want the quick way. So even with education, even with the knowledge, they will say, I was told. 
And that person that told that person will never be known. Because when you ask, who told you? They will never say. And when I told somebody that my eye was doing me like this, the person said that this is the eye drop that he used and it was okay. And the next thing, they are both visiting the chemist or they are visiting a quack. In fact, recently, an 11-year-old child came into the clinic with a, by, by, was brought in by the mom with a corneal laceration that has been there for three weeks. And it's a very severe one. And I told the mom, this is an emergency. I can't guarantee vision in this eye. But at least let me save the architecture of the eye by doing surgery. The mother said, okay, let me go and tell my husband. Then she came back three weeks later. And I'm like, I'm helpless at this point. I don't know what I should do for you. But I still, to give the child some form of comfort, the globe has already sunken. I said, okay, let me place a contact lens because the, the, the content of the eye is already protruding. Let me place a contact lens over the eye so that the child will be comfortable. That content that is trying to come out will go back in. You won't believe me that the woman disappeared. So that's why I'm saying that even with education, our people still seek a faster route. We're doing a lot when it comes to education. A lot of awareness programs are going on. Okay? Diabetic retinopathy, it's, it's an area of interest right now because we have come to find out that a lot of children with poor um, prenatal care, postnatal care also, come up with the um, retinopathy of prematurity. And some of them are not necessarily premature children. So, there is a study going on worldwide. A lot of screening are going on all over the country. I can tell you that specifically. But they are mostly in the tertiary hospitals. Maybe I can't say for, for secondary or primary, primary at all. But secondary, I can't say, but I can tell you all tertiary hospitals all over the country are doing screening for all units. So they work hand in hand with the skibu and also the labor ward. So once a child is born, they go in the screen. And the screen is just not that once. As the child comes for antenatal and postnatal care, as the mother comes in for postnatal care, they screen. They go there and screen. They go to the immunization centers and screen. I used to be part of a team. But since I relocated, I disengaged. Okay? Pre-diabetics, are there eye signs? No. No signs. The signs comes up after like 10 years, especially when it has to do with the posterior segment. But the anterior segment sign might manifest, but not for pre-diabetics. Pre Maybe for the diabetics. Okay. The use of laptop and the eye. Yeah. Excessive use of laptop causes you to stare. So your eyes are dry at all times. And when your eyes are dry, there's a tendency that you develop a corneal opacity which we already know that is a cause of blindness. There are also rays, blue light rays, that comes out from the laptops. They also causes some damages in the eye. So we advise for those that uses excessive, that uses the laptop excessively, they should use photo anti-reflective or anti-blue lenses, okay? You don't necessarily need to have a refractive error or problem with your eye before you use those lenses. So if you are somebody that uses the system at all time, 
you come every time your eyes are pouring water, you feel like there's sand in your eyes, and you always feel like, oh, what is happening to this eye? Go for eye check, we'll advise you to use photo AR or anti-blue lenses. There's, that's the anti, anti glare is the AR, but there's anti-blue. Anti-blue, yes, because there are blue light rays that are emitted from the systems. Okay? Um, we also advise them to think and blink. Think and blink. What does that mean? When you use the system often, you should always remind yourself that you should always blink. So you should make conscious efforts to blink. So we say, think and blink. So when you think about it, you're using the system, you need to blink often, then you blink. Because when you're using the system, you stare at the system. So your blink rates will be prolonged. Okay? Okay, you said there's a patient who had normal pressures but was told to have glaucoma later and it was bad. Yes. There are different types of glaucoma. Different types. There are some glaucoma where the pressures are normal. Pathologies are still going on. Some, you look at the back of the eye, it looks very fine, very pretty. But the pressures are very high. Some, the back of the eye is bad, pressures are high. The reason is that there are a lot of pathways to glaucoma. The, the pathways that lead to glaucoma, there are a lot, a lot. So it can be coming from here or from here, wherever. So it, it, it's not just obstruction of the blood uh, fluid flow. There are vascular implications. There are free radicals that are implicated. I, I, I didn't want to go <laughs> scientific in that sense. So it is very possible that your pressures are normal and you still have glaucoma. And that is why we do some investigations. And the investigations are in stage. We first of all do the minimal ones. Okay, if we get what we are looking for there, okay, we are fine. But when we do the initial ones and we, we still don't have a clear cut, we go for a more advanced one like the OCT, which are even more expensive. So there are a lot of things we put together to establish the fact that a patient has glaucoma. So it's not just pressures are high. Pressures can be normal, there's still glaucoma, and the damages are going on. Okay. Stem cell therapy, yes, there are stem cell therapy ongoing. I don't think we've started doing that here. I don't think I've heard anybody that have started using stem cell therapy here in Nigeria. I'm not sure of that. But there are actually stem cell therapies going on, even for glaucoma. Because the aim is to arrest these diseases from the cellular level, okay? So we have a lot of eye conditions where stem cell therapy are being in use, but I am not sure if we have started using it. I've not heard anybody that have started using it in Nigeria. There may be, but I'm not sure, okay? Routine checkup, what does it mean? Routine checkup means that you don't have any problem. You feel that you don't have any problem. But it is still necessary for you to go to the hospital for a check. Why? Because there are some hidden diseases that don't present themselves, but they are ongoing. So it is very important that you go for a routine check. So that's what we mean by routine check. It's not only for the eye, for the general body also. Okay? Now, glaucoma again. I'll only give a summary of this glaucoma. Glaucoma is the commonest cause for irreversible blindness. 
it is a damage to the optic nerve. Once these damages have taken place, they cannot be reversed. Treatments are instituted not to revive the damaged areas, but to stop progression of the disease. Glaucoma is hereditary. Therefore, for each person that we find with glaucoma, we try to do what we call contact, oh, not contact tracing, but we do a tracing, family tracing. Okay? So we say, you, your children, we need to see them. You, your siblings, we need to see them. You need to ask your parents, ask your uncles, ask your family member if there's anybody that has glaucoma. And anybody that has glaucoma does not really mean the person that is blind. But find out, is there anybody that uses eye drop every time? This eye drop is not finishing every time. So that is one of the ways you know that it seems like it was glaucoma that's causing this. Okay? Now, once you have been established to have had glaucoma or you have glaucoma, treatment is for life. So it's not something you use today and stop tomorrow. It's a continuous treatment. It's for life. And they are usually expensive drugs. Therefore, family support is very important for those who are not um, well-to-do. The drugs are not really cheap. Sometimes, because of the severity of the glaucoma, we will need to use two, three, even four drugs to bring down pressures, help to keep this eye the way it is. And each one may be costing four or five thousand. So family support is very important for patients with glaucoma. Then come to think of it, a father has glaucoma and two of his children also has glaucoma. So the economic implication of glaucoma is high. So glaucoma is a disease that when you see anybody that has it, please give the support as much as possible. I want to also plead with us that if you have a neighbor, a friend, or even a passerby, and you realize that this person seems not to be seen well, please advise this person to come to the hospital because most of them don't. Some of them fall into the wrong hands. And by the time they are coming out of there, the eyes are gone. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for this first round of questions. And I'm sure that if there are no more questions, maybe... But one thing which I would like you to really explain to... Blue eyes. There was, not too long ago, the issue of blue eyes in the African. You know, it was a controversy, and people were beginning to say, oh, how did you come about it, and things like that. Maybe it's just, it's just one-off, you know, um, an African person having, you know, blue eyes, you can see it, and things like that. And it's happened in two uh, siblings, you know, to, the, the two siblings, it's hard to, to do with them. Then secondly, um, this issue of... Um, Ocular hygiene. I just want to, I, I, I was struck about what you said. Ocular hygiene, so important because mannerism, you know, will lead to this. And of course, during this pandemic, we've been asked not to be touching our faces. When you touch your eyes, your mouth, your nose, then you can transfer germs and things like that into all those places, including the eyes. But we do know that the pandemic comes through the nose and through your respiratory system. But however, so, Ocular hygiene issues, you know, really comes, you know, to mind. And then finally, uh, Madam Lecturer, uh, the issue of hypertensive, we cannot but, you know, continue to emphasize on a closing note, the issue of hypertension and diabetes. It's very common in, in our environment, you know, that really lead us, and we can prevent it. We cannot, we should continue to emphasize you know, twice yearly screening, you know, routine check, whether you are there or you are not, 
And for the benefit of the elderly who are watching, they must check their eyes twice a year. Whether you think you are okay, you are not okay, go check your eyes. Make sure there is no cataract, make sure there is no glaucoma, make sure there are no other sinister stuff and things like that. These are hopefully very, very important to ensure that at least the eye care, because without the eyes, is a window to the body, basically. And when the eye is not there, then the whole of the body, you know. So maybe you want to do that just before we do the roundup. Thank you. Okay, thank you once again. The issue of the blue eye, depending on where the blue eyes are coming from. Okay? Now, if the blue eyes are located, you know when you look at our eyes, you see a white portion, you see a black portion. Okay, so if the blue eyes are radiating from just that black part of the eye, I think it has to do with just the pigmentation of the eye. It's not a pathology. But there are instances where the old eyes appear bluish. Both the white parts and the black parts, they all appear bluish as a result of thinning of the sclera. That is a pathology that needs to be taken care of. Okay? So when they talked about the family with the blue eyes, I was like, hey, could that be a congenital glaucoma? What happened? Please let me just look at these people. And I looked. It's just the pigmentation of the iris. And the next thing we saw on the media was that they are seeking for money for one, two, three, or whatever. Mm. Well, I don't know. So as for the best of my knowledge, if the blue eyes is just from the black part of the eyes and we look in, all structures are normal. It is just pigmentation. Okay? You can even see some people that have, instead of that blue, it's yellow. Some have yellow in one eye, black in one eye. It's called heterochromia. So it's not new. Okay? But if the whole eye is blue, especially in children, it's from congenital glaucoma or from scleral issues. So that is a pathology. Um, I, ocular hygiene. Okay? Ocular hygiene cannot be overemphasized because it's very important. You can see during the COVID period, they say do not touch your eyes. It's not an offense to touch the eye in the past. But it's because the hands can always introduce some things there. There are some people too that have discharges in the eyes and they don't see it as a problem. It has to be taken care of. Sometimes when the discharges that are already in the eye are not taken care of, like in trachoma, that's what happens. When one's eye is infected, the child mostly occurs in children, easily transmitted to the mothers. So once the child's eye is infected, the mother comes and cleans the eye, then she uses the hand and rubs her own eye. The effect of the pathology is more in the, elder, in the adults. So the mother is the one that actually comes down with the blindness. Okay? With some other pathologies that uh, takes place. So the hands can always introduce things. When you have discharge, it should be taken care of with drops. You should visit the hospital. Now, sometimes, when the leads are always having discharges, it can occlude some tiny, tiny holes that are there. And that can result to other pathology like the calasium, the style, you know? So it is very important. Like somebody called me someday and said, there's somewhere on top of my lid here that are swollen. It's looking swollen. And I simply tell the person, please get a baby shampoo and always clean your lids. And it was resolved. So 
especially in adults, there are sometimes you have some discharges every time they are just coming out. It will occlude. Some other things to not necessarily discharge can cause all those occlusion. Okay? So it is very important that you maintain ocular hygiene because you never can tell. The people that use their urine to treat Apollo, and I say, you are lucky you don't have gonorrhea. Because if you have gonorrhea, you will surely go blind. There's no medicine that will help you. So it is very important, ocular hygiene. Hypertension and diabetes. They, they are two illnesses that people hear them and they are afraid. Some people ignore them. But it's not supposed to be so. You need to pay a lot of attention to it. Why? Because if ignored, your eyes, you may lose them. And once the eyes have been affected, you are sure that other organs are also affected. A lot of diagnoses of diabetes are made in the eye clinic. A lot of renal failure diagnoses are made in the eye clinic. Because once we see some of the symptoms, we tell them, go and see your endocrinologist. Go and see your physicians. By the time they run some investigations, they will discover that the organs are beginning to have some defaults. So these two illnesses cannot be ignored. There is nothing like I, I used to have hypertension before, but I don't have it again. It also doesn't give symptoms. And that is why you see a lot of people, they'll say that it is slumped. It is very possible that the blood pressure was high. You can be moving around. You don't know that your BP is 220. 220, 120. So it is very important. You check. I advise every elderly person to have the digital um, um, speak in the house and also a glucometer. So you can always check these things. So once you see that they are high, please rush to the doctor. Okay? Okay, what is done to reduce the cost of drugs for glaucoma? Actually, we are the ones that are trying by talking with the manufacturing companies through their drug reps to reduce the cost of glaucoma medication. In the past, there used to be some for 10,000, 15,000, but a lot of them has actually reduced their prices. That is one. Secondly, there was a time that we also tried to form what we call glaucoma association. And the essence of this association is to bring together these people with common diseases, introduce them to the company, so that they can get these drugs cheap. But um, we had some stumbling drugs, um, blocks on the way, so we have to give up on that. But truly speaking, we make efforts to talk to the drug companies to reduce their prices. understand the second part, but abuse of steroid, what is being done? It's still health education. You know, a lot of this happens. Okay, let me give an example. I did a surgery for a patient, and immediately post-op, we give steroids. Then there was a lockdown, and six months later, when I saw this patient, he has used like almost 10 bottles of the steroid. The cornea was melting. My eye, the eye I did surgery for was going. I was mad. I was mad. Health education would have helped. Because he said he actually called somebody that works and the person said, just continue your drugs. So with knowledge, I'm sure, 
Because the standard is that there are some particular group of people that should not dispense steroids. The primary health care level especially, they should not. It's a standard. Okay? And that is what is supposed to be even everywhere, even in the chemists, they are not supposed to. But we keep talking about it, educate patients. So when we give steroids like this, we have to emphasize. This is not something you use continuously, otherwise it will damage your eye. Once you finish this eye drop, come back and see me. If you need to use it again, I will tell you to, and when it's time to stop, we'll stop. Because there are a lot of complications that goes with use of steroids. Okay? Sorry, what was the second part of this? Thank you very much. I think that's about all. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. We've had a beautiful morning, and I think uh, before we ask uh, Ms. Comfort Adibis to come and give the vote of thanks to the lecturer, I just want to appreciate us that are here and to say thank you very much and the many people that are watching, you know, uh, through the streaming and Lagoon TV and radio, uh, to thank them for their patience this past uh, one and a half hours to two hours and uh, also to appreciate uh, Dr. Udunaye, who is also another, you know, uh, ophthalmologist in the house. Uh, Dr. Peter Madi, we want to thank you very much. And Dr. Emi Rena, I want to thank you, Mrs. Uh, you know, Lusonya. Um, we would, when Comfort at ABC, you know, thanks the lecturer for us, we will ask uh, Mrs. Helen Madu to give us the uh, benediction, you know, as we, as we do the doxology and then the benediction. So thank you very much indeed, and we really do appreciate your time. And the salient things that have been raised, we are now better educated, because education, 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 that is the hallmark of why we are here, to make sure people are informed about their health and how to take care of their eyes. That is important, and many other aspects of health care, which we have gone through in the last so many years, in the two decades. These are very important, very, very important. So thank you very much. Um, please, can you just come and uh, appreciate our lecturer? Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Commission and everybody present here and on the internet, we want to thank you for the educative period, the session, and everything. And with this token, we want to appreciate you. God bless you, man. We'll go continue to replenish your knowledge. Praise God from Omar. Blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, praise him above ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There is none that is like the age of being among us. And we can hear. And touch and we can feel. All of us here. Father and our Father, we want to thank you. 
Father, thank you for what we have learned concerning our eyes. Father Almighty, your word is the light of the world. Father, we ask that you thank you for all those that are those that are watching at home, Father, and collectively in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the presenter. Thank you. Father, we ask that you will bless. So from strength to strength in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you, Father, because you will do exceedingly more than we have asked. In the matchless name of Jesus, I have prayed. Praise of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.